So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this conversation today. It's uh, it's mine and Jessica's um, absolute pleasure to welcome Billy Streen um, to this discussion. So Dr. Billy Streen is a professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation at the University of Alberta. He's also an esteemed 3M National Teaching Fellow um, and has really focused on the importance of excellence in teaching, learning and educational leadership for a long Long time. Uh, Billy's also a registered yoga teacher at the 200 and 500 level, a master somatic coach. And really the best thing that I like to, to hear from Billy is, is his joyfulness, which speaks perfectly to the fact that his website is called Adventures in Joy, where he speaks to the power of joy and how joy is a unique tool in learning and can really transform and improve lives. So we've got joy on one hand, and then Billy's also a master of failure. Um, <laughs> Billy has, has written an excellent, uh, an excellent paper on train wrecks. 3M National Teaching Fellows explore creative, creating learning and generative responses from colossal failures. So, Billy, we're so we're so happy to have you here. Um, can't wait to chat. With that introduction, all I can do is take it downhill. I think. <laughs> We go big at the start and then and then we just see where it where it goes. Billy, the, the first thing that we really want to to hear from you is just like that's the bio. That's what we can yeah. find on the website. But but Billy, tell us your story. Like how did you get to become an exceptional teacher within higher ed, um, a leader that that companies, um, students, etc., look up to? What's your story? As I was thinking about this, do you? I think we probably all told our stories and we retell our stories and there's certain ways in which it can become rote. And I noticed one of the things that I probably have not talked about that struck me for whatever reason this morning was my dad was a teacher. And in a sense, it was his second job that he was a professor in the School of Social Work at Rutgers. And it seemed to me that that was almost like his, you know, thing he did on the side and he was a psychoanalyst. And yet I think the fact that he was a teacher and had that excitement about that was one of the influences on me that these things sometimes work more subtly and maybe that's not why it's always part of my story. But I think having grown up um, with somebody who was teaching and my mom did some teaching as well. And there's a lot of teachers in my family. So I think that the way many people follow in the family tradition, there's some of that. And, you know, a lot of these things happen in strange and serendipitous ways. And then we try to tell it as a more linear story than it might have been. I kind of fell into doing some coaching, sport coaching when I was in high school. And I really liked that. And I continued in that path. And I was an athlete and knew I wanted to do something there. And I started off with the idea that I was going to be an elementary teacher and I actually got an elementary ed credential. And one of the things that struck me was I was working with these grade two kids and some of the cutest, most likable boys in particular, I found I was always having to tell them to go sit in their seat because that was the way things were done. And as I think about it now, you know, as we consider what do we take for granted and how does learning look and do we just fit into those structures? And I probably wasn't asking questions like, well, what if I were teaching grade two and I totally altered this so that there was much more opportunity for these active boys to walk around and do stuff. But I realized that the way it was wasn't for me and then I did you know, more sports and more teaching and started teaching classes as a grad student. And, you know, I would say the commonality for me has been I really loved the process and the engagement and in particular the students. And that's what's really kept me motivated um, is being fascinated by, in essence, how do I do a better job for them? 
right? And one of the things that's so obvious, but I don't think a lot of people necessarily pursue it, is if I want to get better at teaching students, I should get really curious about what's working from their perspective. And there are things where I've had what were great ideas inside of my cranium, but from the student's experience, it's like, you're going overboard here, pal, or you know, that just doesn't work. And just getting that feedback and finding out what works, doesn't work, and leaning into that, and lots of talking to great teachers. One of the cool parts of my journey was very early in my days as a professor, and I was, I was telling some of this story in the last couple of days, was I got invited to be part of this peer consultants group at University of Alberta. And at that point, the University of Alberta had all these 3M fellows, and I got to hang around with these incredible teachers who had been at it for a long time, and I got to listen to their stories, and that was both inspirational and educational, and I think that was a part of my path was, like, these are the people I want to grow up to be like. Billy, thank you for, for sort of grounding us in a, a story and the, the storytelling of your adventures in joy. <laughs> adventures <laughs> joy. Well played. <laughs> because it is, it is kinesthetic, right? It is movement. It is embodiment. It is in communion with other, that it is reflected and um, magnified in, in collision with other in a three-dimensional space. So I wonder if you could sort of unpack if if the adventure of joy is in the moment, if it is in the experience, if it is in, if it is staying outside of your seat and moving around and, and getting charges from, from others, how do we how do we harness that if that is in the moment in the present? How do you harness that in hopeful ways into the future? Yeah, that's so great, Jessica. I mean, in some ways, I think what makes you brilliant is you're he you're hearing the things that were not even evident to me, right? That so much of it is is relational, and it is it's embodied, and especially in higher ed, a lot of the way we operate is as if all that matters is from the chin up. And for me, you know, some of these simple cliches, like people don't care what you know until they know that you care, tend to guide you know, the way that I interact. So for me, a lot of it is, yeah, 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 we've got to do certain things inside of certain boxes, but ultimately it's about human beings and, again, with is part of maybe the water that I swim in that becomes invisible is this relating to human beings as thinking, feeling, and acting, and that that's all integrated. And if we try to deal with everything simply as information or cognitively, we're missing the most important pieces, especially if we're interested in how do you actually cause people to take action or how do you cause people not to just know something, but to actually do something different. And I don't know if that addresses the question you're asking. It does, and it adds more to it. And it, it gives me a follow-up question. Sorry, Pat, I'm gonna like steal Billy for a second. Because what I love about about you and the, the way in which you model embodiment and joy is that you make room for silly and you make room for the silly <laughs> and joy. Well, but you do in a way that it doesn't you don't lose rigor you don't lose i hate the the use of the word rigor because it reminds me of rigor mortis right it reminds me of just cognitive and it's often used to bludgeon people who are stepping outside of the the sort of rigid structures of what we understand as the academy but there's something about being silly and being embodied and being in motion that is freeing. And it's not a cliche when you when you live it and you model it. And I just maybe want you to, like I have this beautiful memory of being on a bus with you, I think somewhere in Quebec, as you took us all on breathing and yoga, as we were late and everyone was grumpy and tired and wanted to go to bed and you're like, nope. Oh no, maybe it was in Nova Scotia, but you're like, nope, let's, let's just be 
ourselves and our silly selves and be together in this. And I thought that that was such a powerful un unlocking of parts <laughs> of our heart that we sometimes compartmentalize in the academy. I, I think it was actually laughter yoga. And one of the things that I picked up in my laughter yoga training was the word silly comes from the old English, meaning happy, prosperous, and blessed. So if someone tells you you're being silly, you say, thank you. Yet in its common use or understanding, I think one of the things that's maybe worked for me progressively as the age between me and my students has expanded is that willingness to be something other than the stodgy professor it was really neat. I had a great opportunity. My son, who's an undergraduate, who I, I tried to get to go to Bush, Bishops, but anyway, um, he's at UVic, and I'm really fortunate that uh, he granted me an audience to go out for some beers with him and a few of his buddies. And he said something to me about the difference between me and other parents was, it's not like you're talking to us from another level or that your parents said, part of it is I've been talking to 20 year olds since I've been a 20 year old. And I think, I mean, one of the, one of these moments that pops in my head was a grad student that was told me that if I wear a tie, that it creates a distance. And when I first started teaching and I was still whatever, 28 or 29, that I would wear a tie to class. And part of that was, I think, trying to be something. And one of the things I realized for whatever series of reasons and maybe being a white male is part of it, but part of the way I carried myself and just who I am as a person, I never felt that there was an issue with credibility. And I think partly because of that, the issue for me became how do I make myself more accessible, more vulnerable, more human, more authentic? And so part of that is, you know, part of being silly in a sense is being open to screw up and then embracing it. Right? <laughs> one, of, one of the guys who um, I learned a lot from outside of academe was really somebody about leadership and workshops. He said, you want to screw up in the first five minutes so people can see you're human. And then it's like, how do you respond to that? Because people watch. And we've all been in a room with a presenter or a professor who's trying to get it right. And there's a level of discomfort and anxiety where they are that then spills over on the audience. And when I can go, hey, look, I screwed up. <laughs> look at that, I'm human. I mean, I've said this even flat out with students. I said, you know, Here's the thing, we're all putting in a lot of effort trying to look good and avoid looking bad. And we walk around with armor, we're protecting ourselves. And then there's this just nasty little secret that we're all human. And when I say, look, hey, I'm human, you can go, cool, I'm human too. And it's like, you mean we can be human together? and not have to worry about making mistakes and say, you know, when we, when we make a mistake, let's do a dance. Let's, let's go, how fascinating. You know, isn't that amazing, the different ways we can screw up? And then what's really useful is then, what do we learn from that? You know, it's just a whole orientation of school from the time you're little as you learn it's about the answers and you definitely don't want to get something wrong because then you get the red ink. And, you know, you're bad and wrong and unlovable. Whereas if you say, well, actually, anything worthwhile is going to have mistakes along the way. And so if I can show, look, <laughs> look, I screwed up this, this slide, this, this. But I remember one of the first days of class, 200 students in the mid lecture hall, and I went to throw something out before class started. And like the lid on the top of the can fell off. And then I tried to put it back on. And in that moment, it was you know, the make or break. And I just laughed at my own stupidity or incompetence. 
And yeah, that weekend, there was some student event where they, they did skits and someone did a skit making fun of Billy, try to throw something out. And I think it's, <laughs> I sometimes ask people, do I have a bullseye on me? Because I think I make it very comfortable to make fun of me and maybe because I, I did it first. But I think all of that creates an environment that becomes comfortable and human and authentic. Billy, I'll just jump in and say so much of that resonates with me and my career. Like, I think the whole, like, I can remember being the 27 year old prof who wasn't even on the grid yet of the UNBC retirement chart because I was so close to the students. And I can remember <laughs> putting the shirt and tie on, trying to create this distance. But as soon as I realized that distance didn't matter, then I was a better teacher. I was a better professor I was a better mentor and it was all about like who do I want to be who's my true authentic self what are the true authentic mentors that I've seen in my life okay cool I'm gonna I'm gonna model them not model what the academy tells me I need to do and 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 it's funny because you also mentioned one other piece that I think is critically important which is you know recognizing I'll say our privilege, right? As middle-aged white men, um, et cetera. And so, so my question for you, Billy, is really about how you see the notion of vulnerability within that context, right? Like you and I have it pretty good. We can fail, we can get back up. The tenure and promotion process will be okay to us, but not everyone can do that. So how do we, how do we look at that vulnerability within the system? Uh, several ways I'll come at that. One of them is I'm a, I'm a Brene Brown fan and I do embrace vulnerability and all that. I also think most people, when you hear the word vulnerable, it can conjure up this idea of that you're going to be harmed. <laughs> and I tend to talk more about being open. Now, clear, clearly, in a sense, openness implies or includes that your armor's down and that you are able to be impacted or hurt. So I think, you know, I think there's a way though in which we characterize it that can make it more palatable or make people lean into it. And I think there are a number of things I do. I mean, one is I tell stories and often they're ones where I did something uh, where there's a foible, it's self-deprecating humor. And yet, I mean, it was, it was funny to me, my, I think it was my first term on Zoom, the students organized some kind of social hour because everybody was, you know, locked down and all that. And it was, and it was great. And so I came on and my wife Paula popped in and it was as if everybody already knew her. She was she she was a character in the class. I would tell stories about I teach about communication, and for example, I I we'd be doing something about listening, and then I tell a story about how I just failed massively in my main relationship because I didn't listen. And you know, remember when I talked about doing this in class? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Um, so that I think is part of instead of being instead of being just this person who shows up in front of the room, you know, I, I talk about my kids, I talk about what I did on the weekend, I talk about my concerns and all of the stuff that makes me a three dimensional, imperfect being. I think that's a, a big part of openness and vulnerability. And then I know that it's the same thing. But one of the things I think is important is a genuine curiosity. Like I want to get to know who the students are. One of the things I miss most is the informal interactions. You know, I would always be, at a, I mean, I'm still the first person to show up, but in the Zoom room, I find as we've progressed, <laughs> it gets closer and closer till the second class starts that most people show up. But in a typical situation during those 10 minutes, as people wander in, 
there's every little opportunity to get to know you and find out you know what's working, what's not working, what do you care about, what's the rest of your life like. I think that that, in a sense, that res that reciprocity, the leaning in and being curious, we don't often think of that as vulnerability, but I think it's, I, I, I do a lot of stuff around openness and I talk about how there's two sides to openness. One is the willingness to express, the other is being open to receive. And whereas, you know, I, you know, I like to talk, I like to tell stories, that I'm very conscious of being open in the sense of being a space to to hear from. I mean, one of the, I think one of the best compliments I ever got was a student said to me, whenever I had a question for Billy, he'd have two back for me. And, you know, it's that kind of one, one of the things creating, you know, maybe as you're saying, but maybe because I have certain characteristics, it's easier for me to position myself as equal as possible. And I, I think maybe other people maybe don't have that luxury. And it's hard to say what's, you know, because I'm of a certain age or color or this, um, and what's my personality. I think, you know, sometimes I feel like um, th things that are because of how I act, that's not just because I have white, ma white middle-aged male on me, but, you know, maybe, maybe that's part of that. But whatever it is, I think I think we're all hungry for authenticity. I think we want to connect. I think it's it's clearly in our DNA that we're herd animals. We want to connect. And then we do all these goofy things to keep ourselves separate and presumably safe. Jessica, if I can sneak in one more, like yes. like you sneak in on me. <laughs> Just... I'm gonna make it quick. Yeah. Okay. Well, Billy, I mean, you've really touched on, you know, the importance of, of movement in your teaching and things like this. And then quite a few times you sort of linked out to the Zoom and the, where we've been the last few years. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to how you see failure and vulnerability happening differently in the sort of the pre-COVID and then the current like teaching online circumstance and and even future cast to you know what it might look like in the future because I think there's some you know lots of people have had colossal tech failures in the zoom environment lots of people have have had x y and z that may there may be some commonality there that there wasn't before but yeah. but I want to hear your thoughts on it a few things. One, you know, to, as you said, there are going to be tech failures. And, you know, one of the opportunities to make a mistake and then how do you respond to it is inevitably you're going to you're going to be going. And then a student go, Billy, you're muted. <laughs> now, do you get upset or do you? Yeah, I mean, I did this. I was doing a thing for people through a library this past week and I put them in the breakout room. And because I hadn't set it up, I didn't realize that it was defaulted to mute everyone when they come back. So I come back and I'm doing my, you know, somebody says this, I said, you know, I don't know if you know that 17% uh, of words spoken in 2021 were into a muted <laughs> mic. So, you know, so there's things to be able to, to, to be playful. So I think, I think one, there's going to be more and different tech screw up, so that's an opportunity to do that. I think, and this is all kind of speculative, I think there's something fascinating about a screen of faces. Now, I've pretty much whenever possible organized my classes so that people sit in a circle so they can see each other. But one of the things that students will talk about is seeing faces versus the back of people's heads. So there can be be some ways in which there's an intimacy of we can all see each other. I think there's lots of ways in which we connect that we don't even begin to understand. I mean, we may have some clues about limbic resonance or things that happen in the physical space that I don't think happen. I don't think right now we have the same energy exchange as if we were a few feet physically together. So I think there's something different there. I wonder if in some ways it creates a sense of greater safety. 
you know, students are presenting in front of the class and it's almost like, you know, if this goes real bad, I could turn this thing off, you know, or I am in my own home sometimes. So I think there's some ways in which there's been an enabling of certain kinds of greater connection. And there's a huge, it depends. Um, one of my classes I taught on, I taught on Zoom and then I was back in the classroom in the fall. And it is, you know, literally hands on. There's lots of stuff that to me is just not possible in a three, in a, in a, you know, two dimensional space or whatever. And I think there's ways we connect and engage that are only possible um, when we're physically in three dimensions together. So there's, you know, maybe you could say there's a greater possible threat or ways in which, and so therefore people may default to being more protective in those environments, but also there's a greater possibility to connect more richly and deeply. And, you know, I think there's, we have, a, we have a moment in which we can be more conscious and maybe more discriminating about why do we do this and why do we do that. And some of the blanket things that are said about remote are just plain stupid. Some of the blanket things that are said about synchronous asynchronous are also goofy. And I think there's some more careful consideration about what are we trying to accomplish and what ways work the best. So I think that's part of um the path forward. I think that's really interesting, Billy, because you know, I've been um, for a long time informed by Harrington and Reeves' work on authentic learning environments, and they have 10 design principles. And it's, you know, it's a thing, they've studied it, they came up with it, and they started it in the early 2000s for online learning. So they came up with these 10 design principles and they include things like um, interdisciplinarity, collaboration, critical reflection, um, a final product of assessment, um, a question that doesn't have a singular answer. But they came up with that to create authentic learning environments in online learning. And what they realized was those design principles translate you know, across modalities and platforms. And so that that notion of authentic, right, as a as a design principle for the ways in which we are are sort of building our our spaces, whether they're two dimensional or three dimensional, sort of resonating as a as a word or as a theme that we're exploring is the word authentic, <laughs> right? That we use has to be intentional. It's it's used a lot. It's used unintentionally. It's used without reflection um, sometimes. But I think you're right that we all have a desire to be authentic, to bring our whole selves to our endeavors, to link our work with purpose, to have, um, you know, in, in philosophy, a telos, like a trajectory, something that gives us a shape and, and something of life's purpose. And I like how the two of you sort of bounced off one another about authenticity and credibility based on your intersectionality. Those weren't three multi-million dollar words in the bingo of <laughs> the 21st century. I don't know what is, but... What does it mean to be authentic and credible and have authority and expertise is really driven by our intersectionality, by our race, by our age, by our geography, by our education, by our socioeconomic status, by our, our gender, by our um, sexuality, all of those things, right? So it all comes in in this in this really difficult mix. So you've talked about how to model authenticity from your position of intersectionality. I didn't know I was doing that. You did. You did. So you're like, okay, here I know, under, and I understand. And I think one of the things that that you were doing with a kind of critical reflection was like, listen, if I am from the center of power as a middle-aged white man with expertise, I can give away credibility while still not being super vulnerable. But that's not just a privilege of you. That's also reshaping students' expectations so that the, when they step into a classroom with somebody who has a different intersectionality might be able to think about different modes of credibility, authority, and expertise, right? So there's something that you're modeling, which is generous and generative for other people. But I want to push you a little bit on systems. 
So how do we actually build? So you're modeling it as an individual, which is fantastic. And you're doing it as, as a kind of leadership and advocacy piece. But how do we reframe? And, and I think the three of us would agree that the systems in place right now in the academy at all of our institutions that we've worked at and studied at are inhospitable to the authentic self. That close us off in cognitive ways that divorce silliness and emotional and spiritual and, and other kinds of being. We're not invited to bring that to... Mm -hmm to this learning environment, to this research environment, to this teaching environment. How do we make more hospitable systems? How do we invite it in? How do we make it valued and visible? How do we allow for communities of practice where being, being all of your messy, imperfect self is as safe for a queer woman of color as it is for a middle-aged white man? How do we, how do, we do that? I think one of the linchpins is assessment and evaluation. You know, it's been said that people pay attention to what gets measured. I think most students go through their dozen or so years before they get to us learning implicitly and explicitly that it's all about marks and grades. So there's different ways that we can seek to disrupt that. I mean, one of the things that I've attempted to alter, and I think we're slowly starting to see some things, is one of the most fundamental things in higher education is Neanderthal final exam practices and policies. And it's almost as if that's the starting point. And so I'm going to give a final exam and then depending on how many students and how much time pressure and what else, that's gonna drive all of the teaching and learning. And it's mostly creates bad or inferior <laughs> ways of going about what we do. So I think that's one of the systemic things that I think is most impactful. If we look at all the high impact practices, I don't think anywhere on the list is two hour written final exams, right? And so like what other things can we have that matter, that get measured, that students can care about? And I think if we can diminish, <laughs> diminish and dismantle the exam system, I think that's a huge place we can we can move. And I think that that is possible without disrupting the credentialing business that I think we're in. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the things is to make, I, I'd say um, maybe correlated with that, because everybody's heard stories about showing up on the first day of university and they say, look to your left, look to your right. You're only one of you is going to be here in three years. And my attitude has always been, look to your left, look all the way around the circle, <laughs> you know, look to the right, look all the way around the circle. Imagine what's possible if every single person here cares about every other person here. And if every person here is doing everything you can do to try and make this the best possible situation. If you can see someone and they need something and you give it to them and there's no threat to you, Right? Another thing that gets communicated along with this is this idea of grade distributions, which in many cases is pure mythology. But I know in some of the institutions where I work, they hand people things and they're descriptive, like the typical GPA for a first year class is 3.11. And one of the things I say to students is the difference between something that's a description of what's happened in the past and a prescription. I said, what have we found out that typically students in this class were five foot six? Now this year, let's say the average is five foot nine. Are we gonna go around with a machete and hack three inches off every student so they fit the historical average? Like this is just something so you kind of know here's how it's tended to go. But there's no rule or there should be no rule that says, you know, everyone needs to, and it's this whole idea of creating mediocrity, 
you know, I, I joke about it because I'm from a sports background. I said, the basketball coach said, you know, it'll be cool if we could get two guys to shoot free throws at 90%, but we really wanted most of them to shoot in the 70s. Like, that's good. That, that's a better th- turnout. And I said, no, 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 no. In, in a lot of environments, you're trying to get everybody to be as close to the highest level of excellence as possible. Shouldn't our educational model be that? As if I do everything really, really well, and you do everything really, really well, and maybe it's even a class that people have chosen to be in, and maybe people are excited about the job. Like, wouldn't it be reasonable, because we've not just also taken a normal curve of people, we've taken people who have already excelled more and more ridiculously already, having a 90% average walking in the door, Why don't we create an atmosphere that says everybody can win, everyone can excel? I think those are two of the core things to whatever, disrupt change for creating an environment that's one in which people learn, are collaborative, are supportive, are not feeling under threat all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Billy, you just blew my mind because you just connected the... um, you know, the entire argument of rigor, right? Which is like, I, there's 90% and then there's 70% that rigor is creating a culture of mediocrity. Well, if rigor, <laughs> if rigor means some, some excel and some, you know, are, you know, most are here and some fail and we, and if we're doing our job, we produce yeah, a normal there. curve. Yeah. Like another form of rigor is, you know, like, I, I can show you 24 final speeches from my students and almost all of them are, maybe all of them are better than a bunch of doctoral presentations I just saw from another institution because it was an environment in which it was designed to have everybody become great and, and everybody more. support they each other in that. More. So there's rigor. Yeah. There's rigor. I mean, I don't go, you know, people don't do crappy and I don't say, oh, that was just so wonderful. Let's give everybody a trophy. You know, that's that's lack of rigor. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's lack of excellence where you meet somebody where they are and work with them to transform as an adventure of joy, which is what you do. Uh, right? yeah. you meet them where they are and you build with them something that they are they are better at than when they started. I love that point where if you come in as a 90 student, I often wonder, am I here to help you? I can <laughs> like can we transform? Like, yes. But what about that 61 year old 61 percent student who's coming in? They can be 61 years old. <laughs> yeah, sure, or they can yeah. be 18. But to come in and be like, let's transform together in reciprocal ways in ways that are fostered in joy and delight over the 12 week term the four year degree and the 50 years of learning that you're going to have there's two key things you said that are so taken for granted one is with and the other is together i heard someone say it this way there's you know again anytime there's two kinds of you're in trouble but so there's two kinds of professors one who kind of puts the class there and keeps moving it further and further away from you. And then the other one who puts the class there and keeps moving it toward you, right? And it's the idea of, I think a way of thinking about rigor is let's create an exciting challenge that doesn't, doesn't look easy. It actually looks, whatever you want to call it, difficult or rigorous. And now we're climbing the mountain together. Like, I'm gonna help boost you up. When you're falling, I'm gonna try and find ways to help you keep moving higher and higher up the mountain. Which is totally different from then going like, ha 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 ha, oh, I have the answers, oh, I have the power. Let's see if you could ever get here. And to me, it's, a, it's so fundamental, right? To say, yeah, we're putting something in front of us and then we're going towards it together. I think that's a key orientation. Pun, no pun intended there. See what I did, Pat? 
so uh, so Billy, that like that automatically takes me to a to a question where this is kind of me playing devil's advocate, but but I just like to know your take on it. So, you know, we've got working with students, marching together, um, you know, building relationships. I mean, you can go down the whole Peter Felton um, relationship rich, um, you know, sort of pipeline, et cetera. But I'm just wondering how you take that model of excellence, uh, creating relationships, doing things together and put it in a 400 student class that's on Zoom, right? Or like, I, I understand that it works very well in the, small fourth year seminar where everybody's coming to see Billy because they want to learn about silly and and you know what if they all do very well and they buy into it because they love this environment they're probably all going to come out with the 95s right but how do you do that in intro to phys ed and recreation for 400 students I mean I could play devil's advocate about the whole idea of playing devil's advocate Right. I mean, I think I think if I think there's a simple way of turning that back on you and say, just why not? I mean, what what is it about? No, I'm not I'm not Pollyanna. And I would say if you have 400 students, the likelihood that 400 of them will all achieve at the highest level, I think, is far more challenging, difficult, unlikely. But the difference, I think, fundamentally, is when you walk in the door, and the door may be metaphorical if you're talking 400 on Zoom, but when you begin and the message you give is there's no reason why there's winners and losers, you know, I think you do it differently. I think if you want, I mean, if you want to cause collaboration, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm questioning whether there's things that I could even do with 36 that I've been able to do with 24. And it, like, there's bits of literature that may support that. But you could say, all right, I've got 400 students, what meaningful connections and collaborations have to be designed so they have that experience of support, they have others in a meaningful way where they know their name, pulling them forward. But if you if you said, you know, it, it, like, let's, I mean, maybe it's a good example. If you said, I've got 400 people who are, you know, engineers who are gonna build a bridge that my family's going to drive over. Or I've got 400 people who are going to be surgeons and one of them at random is going to operate on my mother. You know, wouldn't you think about that model differently to say, <laughs> I want to make sure the 400th is at least pretty darn competent. And I think when our orientation is, you know, all I have to do is make sure i mean it's sort of the easy thing to do make sure the people are already highly motivated highly skilled very bright strong backgrounds make sure they are performing in the high 90s you know not much of an achievement so to me if you say all right orient yourself towards the students so that everyone gets as far along the journey and achieves as highly as possible given the constraints i mean I always say to students, we, in terms of the marks and grades, we're measuring something in the realm of performance. That's not saying that's what you're fully capable of. If you didn't have four other classes, if you didn't have a job, if you didn't have, you know, health challenges, if you didn't have mental health, if you didn't have all a these pandemic. things. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, but, but saying given the constraints, how much can we support each other? How much can we move along towards as high a level as possible? Just to rehabilitate Pollyanna here. I love that people are like, I'm not Pollyanna. I'm not 100% hopeful. I'm like, but to echo Billy, why, why not? And, and, you know, adding that critical prefix to hope, I think is really important, which you've just done very eloquently. And I always quote Maria Popova, who talks about um, critical thinking without hope. So thinking deeply and cognitively without hope is cynicism, right? It doesn't actually get you anywhere and it doesn't get you, you farther along in what the possible is, but then hope without critical thinking is 
naive, right? So it's a Pollyanna. And so it discard, but it discards like Pollyanna talking about like feminizing and infantilizing hope. And I talk about hope with a lot of people who are like, I'm not Pollyanna. I'm like, but, but why not? <laughs> with, with some critical thinking and a dash of like understanding systems and design thinking, why aren't we challenging the actual in the name of the possible? Why aren't we challenging these systems and saying, no, this is not just how it's going to be. We are not okay with that as the status quo. We have to think bigger and better. And you started with the ungrading, right? Let's get rid of final exams. And you even said, because- I didn't say ungraded. You didn't say ungrading. You said, let's get rid of final exams without disrupting the credentializing business that we're in. But my yeah. question to you is, let's disrupt the credentializing business that we're in. Like, well, okay, let's yeah, I, think bigger. What does I it think, look like to think yeah, bigger? I think, I think there's a few juicy bits there. One, one is, there's certain places where credentials are more important than others, like if somebody's going to do the surgery or build the bridge. And there are other areas where we could say, you know, you're not going to hurt anybody and let's really just focus on learning. You know, wouldn't that be interesting? Or I mean, there's a lot of other ways we could say, what does it mean to have a credential? And sometimes, it's, you know, all that stuff. So I think there's that. I think the problem is we tend to privilege credentialing and lose learning in the process. So there's there's that piece. Um, <laughs> I think I should probably get a more clear reference. You know, Pollyanna becomes this thing we say, you know, and think about well, what is the story there? And what is that? What am I actually saying there? And geez, maybe I should, you know. Um, but it's funny. One of the things that strikes me is we all like professorial types. I think we're almost trained to be overly critical. You know, when you can pick something apart, you get a lot of pats on the back. And there's this whole thing, you know, if you can point out what's wrong, it's as if you're smarter. And one of one of the things I've evolved, one of the, one of the ways I think I've evolved is you could call it strengths based, but the I've been way more aware of the power of assessment and the way in which assessments are communicated. And I pretty much focus a lot on what's going well. And I know from a sports background, a good coach will often see the one mistake you're making and say, okay, Jessica, you need to do, not even you need to, this is you not doing this, you need to do this, right? And what I'll do is students will do speeches and I think two things happen. One of the things I'll say, Pat, what I loved about your speech was your introduction just grabbed us. That was really awesome. And the way you use it, and I'll hit on these positives. Now, that's really important for learning because you're looking at what works and you're reinforcing it. And I think we don't do that enough. And then the way in which we give the feedback, it would be even better if, or it would be stronger next time if, and some of these things, it's, well, you're being too soft or you're being this. No, it just works. And then it creates an atmosphere where no one's afraid to get up in front of a class to be ripped. I mean, probably we've all had those experiences. If not, we've seen the TV shows where the law student stands up and gets torn a new one. If you know when you stand up that this, this guy's on your side, it's going to point out what's to being done well and talk about what could be even better. To me, that's that's another way in which I think we can change what tends to be standard operating procedure, which is let's point out the mistakes. Well, and that can really work on an ecosystem level, right? Like I, I, I'm right there alongside the two of you on the whole, like me playing devil's advocate was just that. Like I fully agree with what, what's been said. I think too often we see these as disparate things, right? The the big classes that are introductory that are faceless and nameless, but they're really just, you know, 40 or 50 smaller ecosystems within them. And they can be portrayed like that and they can be run like that, you know, if we change the system, right? If we figure out, you know, Billy is the leader of a team of 
you know, 10 caring TAs that can do the same things that Billy does, you know, in smaller groups and, and, and things like that. So I think there's, there, there's, there's movement there already. I think if we're, if we're designing this, you know, Hope University, I mean, I would, I, if I had a choice, I would say there'd be a ma the maximum class size would be relatively small, you know, and if for whatever reason you're saying we must have larger classes, I think what you said, Pat, is true. I mean, I taught a class with 200 where I said if we want, and it was a critical thinking class, and I said, well, we need a dozen sections where students are in smaller groups and have that kind of meaningful feedback. And clearly these things are resource intensive. Now, there may be ways if, there, if it's really a resource issue, which I think if we're saying let's build something based on some of the significant limitations we may have, it may be one prof and a large number of students. And then it's like, how do you become most creative and most effective in designing teams of 10 students or smaller each that produce some of those same valuable results? So. Billy, can we come back just to a point that I really um, resonated for me about how we are trained to, to be critical of arguments or concepts and that shows up in the ways in which we we take down or we deconstruct somebody's argument or project or research findings and we do that in our you know review or two or we do that in a promotion evaluation document or we do that like we're trained and i i'm in i go to disciplinary conferences where people love that it's a sport right it's a blood sport and it is one of the reasons why i've gravitated towards more research that is applied and grounded and much more interested in teaching and learning because this is a community that is not about blood sport i, I came across this thread uh the other day and it, it's still a very new concept for me but um this guy named john warner talks about the difference between debaters and illuminators. Mm -hmm. So debaters entrench, and I'm teaching a course on rhetoric right now. So I'm like really into like attuned to those nuances, but that he argues that um, illumination reveals a complex, more nuanced situation, likely involving some measure of institutional failure, and that it takes a bunch of different concepts and puts them together in a cluster so that those concepts illuminate a larger complex, wicked problem, whereas a debater goes and takes a straw man or straw person, let's be gender inclusive about the meanness of this, but then takes it down in order to show that they're right. And so he's making an argument here in, in public discourse, but I think we could apply it to the academy that we have, we have created and we value and we've internalized the debater sort of dynamic to the extent where we have lost the illuminator, which is looking at beautiful and sometimes disparate concepts, putting them together as a cluster and allowing the collisions between those concepts to provide us with a different kind of lens. Mm -hmm. Does that speak, I, I feel like that speaks to both of your pedagogical philosophies that you are illuminators rather than debaters, even though you just took each other on as devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I'd say you have your sophisticated rhetorician inebriated by the exuberance of your own verbosity or no, I think I think you have you're, you're saying things in very eloquent terms that are far more clever and interesting than how I would frame them. So thank you for that. You know, I, I have a few comments on it. I mean, the notion if you just think in a really simple way, I've got this this light and it's illuminating. The whole thing of debate and as you characterize it, one of the biggest follies, and I will say this, of human beings is the desire to be right. So if we have systems that fuel the training in being right and making others wrong, it's it's. I mean, I could joke about it, but I say it's gen it's I get really emotional about this. I mean, if you look around the world right now, fundamentally, it's an us and a them with a right and a wrong. 
And if you can say that that is all based on a false sense of separation, that we are all connected, the, 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 that juicy kind of ah, feeling you get of being right, you know, could be very much dislodged if you could say it's equivalent to your right arm tearing off your left arm. You know, it's not going to feel good for very long. So I think there is really something crucial to say, let's change the game. You know, can we can if we really are illuminating and, I, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, we're doing a better job of seeing, right? <laughs> you know, it's the old one about looking, looking for your keys where you're you know, not where you drop them, but where the light is good. So if we're, if we're actually illuminating the whole thing, it's a process of saying we're going to see everything about it more fully. And then we're going to be able to solve problems more effectively versus we're going to make something binary and trash one side of it. Yeah. Well, and it's back to your... Um... And, and I also love Brene Brown, where she says there's a difference between being right and getting it right. Mm-hmm which is pretty fundamental. And it's the difference between a fixed finite mindset and a growth infinite mindset. And you're right, we have, we have gotten into most of the problems of the world because we are fixed finite and, and right rather than growth infinite and getting it right. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, in a lot of ways, I think there's a fundamental misconception. I remember when I was an undergrad and I, I heard a commencement speech, I think it was uh, Kenneth Galbraith, and that th it's, it's kind of weird in, in recent days, recollections of threats of nuclear war that seemed very real as an undergrad in the 80s. And he talked about, you know, two boys standing in a garage with gasoline on the floor you know, and one had five matches and the other had seven matches and they're arguing about who has the better strategic position or something like that. And, you know, there's all these metaphors. If we view, and I mean, I'm, in a way, I set this up without calling this for the classroom. But if you say we're all, you know, if we're all on the spaceship and there's only so much air, <laughs> You know, but we all have to figure out how we're going to breathe together. Anything that I put in, I ultimately end up breathing back myself. If there's that sense of being in it together, there is no us and them. You just behave dramatically differently. And, you know, in some ways, I think it's the fundamental failure of humanity is the willingness to act like we're separate and treat the other like object. And so you could say what we're, what we're talking about is in some ways the microcosm of, you know, how do human beings interact with each other and how do those with power um, interact with those who are, they are to lead. I think, you know, I think that's probably something, again, going sort of all the way back to my story. I think very early on in a sport context, I saw horrible things of how parents were all about winning and how certain kids, you know, there were kids who were given playing time and kids who were not giving playing time. And probably very early on, something was born within me about if you've like, it's this, this thing where I get very fired up about you know, if you have power, you damn well better take care of the people who are, you know, under your whatever it is. Really, that just like, it, it brings me to a place of total circular sort of wrap, wrap up sort of in, in a way you've already answered this question, but I'd really just love to know, like, you know, what are the, in teaching and learning, in life, et cetera, what are the things that keep you up at night? Or what are the things that get you up in the morning that are just like, <laughs> I got to work on this, or maybe they're the same things, who knows? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. It took me, it took me a long time to 
identify as what might be called something like a sensitive person. And I think a lot of what either a lot of what keeps me up um, and it's, it's almost what I've, I found lately. It's it's almost like an unwillingness to unwillingness or inability to be with in humanity. It's like I it's like I, and I, I'm do, I, I mentioned I'm doing this course um, for the library and I, it was I guess or um, uh, advertised via um, alum some alumni channels. So I've had a number of former students. I had one student in the class in this. A, a woman who was in this program was in a class with me 25 years ago. And she sent me the, one of the most impactful emails I've ever had. And she said, this was, this was, there was a breakdown of international peace talks. And she said, you were clearly genuinely upset about this and kind of disappointed as human beings that this is where we were at. And I think when I allow myself <laughs> That's what keeps me up at night is, I mean, I've asked this question and it seemed to be, it, seem, it seems in some ways more, more tame than the current, but still pretty awful. Over the last number of years, I've asked myself this question of how do we lean in and listen when we disagree so vehemently? So that's one of <laughs> all that realm of stuff. And there's more um, sleeping is one of my weakest skills. So <laughs> things do keep me up. Um, I think what gets me going, I mean, I know on days when I'm going to be with students, just that that's, you know, I, I, I don't think there's been too many days where I go, I'm going to write a research paper today. Yes. Yeah, it's it's I'm gonna I'm, I get to I get to be with students the engagement the interaction the connection the energy all of that that's that's what gets me going that's what that's what fuels me that's why I feel really blessed to be able to have those opportunities I mean it's funny because I think a lot of my colleagues the idea of sabbatical is you know, the the phrase might be I don't have to teach. <laughs> And I'm kind of like the downside is I don't get to teach. And although some of the marking and grading and the bureaucracies I'm happy to be away from, for me, it's the absence of that connection and engagement. It's almost like my my fuel tank is never quite full or, you know, or I'm running on fewer cylinders because I don't have that energization. That, that feels like uh, me as a university administrator now, right? Like I don't get to teach, right? And it's that lack of connectivity with the students that's so missing. Yeah, I don't understand all you silly people who are great teachers who then go and do these things so you hardly ever teach. Well, somebody has to change the, change the system. From well, thank you for doing that then. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's, it's tied back to your introduction that, that Pat gave you on the um, train wrecks and in, in the title was the word generative and generative and generativity is an entire field of social psychology that talks about how do you build legacies that you will never benefit from. So how do you build things that are deeply generative? It's, you know, how do you plant a tree that you'll never sit in the shade of? Um, and one of my, my friends works on generativity and she disrupted, this will not be new to you. I'm sure you're, you're, um, you're practicing this and anchoring it every day, but that older people are, were considered to be more generative. Eric Erickson, who sort of was the, the founder of generativity was like, as you look into the final phase of your career, life, whatever, you look to build legacy. And yet uh, my friend Heather Lawford found and unlocked that generativity happens with young people and it happens with tremendous potential and power um, and that you can be generative at every stage and age of your, your place in the world. And it is tied to purpose and making a difference and having a positive impact on other humans. And I think that, that Billy, you do that generatively in your work modeling failure and train wrecks. You do that in your classes and connection. You do that in asking why not. Um, you do that in, in modeling silliness 
not in the absence, <laughs> but in, in the joy of being generous enough for people to laugh with you, not laugh at you. And I think there's something really different um, about those two things. And you invite people to, to come with their full and authentic selves with all of the messiness and complexity and intersection that 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 allows for. So I just want to thank you on behalf of myself. I've, you've, you've given me light bulb moments. I've written a number of things down that I'm going to percolate on. And um, just on behalf of me and, and Pat, thank you for, for joining us in conversation today. It has been illuminating. Thank you, well, th thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the things we could say about why, you know, why do you be around certain people? And I don't know that we actually distinguish this, but it's like, who do you get to be when you're with this person and what you, like who I get to be in your, you know, your space or what you, how are you relating to me? is just, that's just so extremely generous. And it's, you know, I, I would like to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have you be that you guy. Are. You are. You that are that guy. <laughs> and always. And we're so we're so grateful for all of the work that you do that a lot of it is invisible and a lot of it shows up in the, you know, the email from somebody 25 years ago. But you have that profound and magnifying effect on on so mm -hmm. many. So, so thank you. Thank you.